Yeah, that is a uh, not oil. Hey guys, Josh with the Adept Tape Channel here. And I often get asked, hey, what do I think of Cummins? What do I think of International? And the other day I got a chance to look at International. It was at one of our rental trucks. And if you notice, there's no coolant in the reservoir. It got towed in, it was on a job site. The customer said it just stopped running, wouldn't start again. The truck driver said, hey, I think something's wrong with the engine. Uh, majorly wrong, it won't start, it sounds weird. So, first thing to do when there's no coolant in the reservoir is check the oil level. If it's really high, then you kind of have a good indication of where the coolant might be going to. Now, it might be hard to tell here, but the oil level is quite high. Several inches above the full mark, which is not good. You know, typically an inch on the dipstick is about a gallon, although that can vary significantly. But anytime you're significantly over the full mark, you know you have something going on, either fuel or coolant or something getting in the oil. It's making oil, basically. Since we don't have any coolant in it, we suspect we have coolant in the oil. Now, I won't show coolant on the dipstick typically because coolant is water-based. It's heavier than oil, so oil will float to the top. So when you pull your dipstick through, the last thing it touches is oil. So it's hard to tell if you have coolant in your oil just by looking at the dipstick. Now, anyone who's worked on a cat truck knows this distinct dash control display here and also the annoying buzzing. So let's fire it up or try to. Now notice it has an inconsistent speed while cranking. That typically means you have something wrong internally with the engine because it's either hydrolocking or you have a dead or weak cylinder. Fluid is in one of the cylinders. Something's going on to cause it to have, uh, we'll say inconsistent compression along the cylinders. Now I didn't crank it for long without, I kind of knew right away, okay, yeah, we definitely have something wrong with this engine. Let's look at the exhaust. And, yeah, that is steam. That's not exhaust smoke. So what we did was we aired up the air tanks. We actually had to push this truck in with a forklift. And they wanted me to further diagnose what was going on. Where was this coolant? How was it getting into the oil? So first thing, obviously, you need to do is drain the oil out of it, which I suspected would be mostly coolant, at least... At first, you'll get mostly coolant because, like I said before, coolant is heavier than oil, so it's going to be on the bottom. Yeah, that is, uh, not oil. That's oil. Now, what we've got going on here is... Oil pan's off, obviously. Now, the oil pan is some sort of composite. It's very light, uh, kind of nice. And I've pressurized the cooling system, and you can see number five cylinder is just pouring fluid out of it. Uh, obviously, we've got some major problem with this cylinder. Not sure if we've got a blown head gasket, a cracked cylinder head. My guess would be cracked cylinder head, but not really sure. They decided without me tearing it down further, they were going to tow it out and just auction the truck off, unfortunately. But that kind of gets us into a little discussion about the Navistar products. So as I mentioned earlier in this video, this entire video is not just about me working on that one truck. I didn't actually have that much footage, I only had about three minutes of that. More I wanted to talk about International in general, or Navistar, which owns International Harvester. We'll just say Navistar or International from now on. And what my opinion of them is. Now, I'm not an expert when it comes to International. I know CAT engines very well. But I worked on quite a few of their Max Force 11 and Max Force 13 engines, also known as the CT-11 and the CT-13 and the CAT trucks. They are Max Force engines. And what do I think of them? The base engine's actually not a horrible design. It didn't have a ton of problems, I want to say. The base engine, that is. However, they had a ton of EGR problems, and the worst part about them was not the EGR system, but their wiring. They had endless wiring problems. For some reason, international engineers seem to think that if you use a different connector and a different plug for every single connector and sensor, it somehow makes the system better. Well, it doesn't. And 
using the smallest wire gauge size possible also not the best idea when it comes to engines i hate international wiring i hate it now unfortunately they also use this in their cabs international trucks have some of the worst cab wiring problems i've seen at least compared to let's say a peterbilt or a kenworth which are both packard products i don't like internationals in general now what has this meant for the industry? Well, it's not just my opinion. International actually doesn't even offer their own engines in many of their truck's product lines for their new trucks anymore. They offer Cummins in pretty much all their product lines, but not International, only in some of them. Now, why am I discussing this? Well, I actually read a little article the other day, and it was talking about a court case, and I actually found a couple other court cases involving Navistar, the parent company to International, and I thought I'd like to share it and discuss it, and maybe you haven't run across it yet and might find it interesting. So the first article that I came across, it was in my news feed, was it involved a Tennessee court ruling, a Supreme Court ruling, Tennessee Supreme Court ruling. And basically what had happened is a company had purchased about 200 trucks, and they were international Navistar trucks. And basically, they started having a bunch of problems, and the company that bought the trucks believed that fraud had been committed by them from International because basically the trucks were down so often it ended up costing the company millions of dollars in unexpected downtime and repairs. Now, Navistar, of course, was held, and they did their warranty repairs. It's just the truck downtime and all that is obviously Navistar doesn't pay that. Cat doesn't, no one really does. And so basically it went to a court and a jury found them, I guess they found, I wouldn't say guilty, but basically they awarded this company that bought the trucks several million dollars, uh, about 30 million overall for loss of revenue from them buying these international trucks. So obviously that doesn't really give you the best reputation if you are being sued for $30 million because your trucks are so unreliable. Now, the article was actually discussing that it was appealed and on the higher level, they actually overturned the ruling because they were claiming fraud and basically a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo, but basically the jury had awarded this company a bunch of money and now a higher court had reversed the ruling basically. Now, the other one that did not get overturned was one from the Department of Defense. This is a federal problem in which Navistar agrees to pay $50 million to resolve false claims. And that is due to a military vehicle and a subsidiary of Navistar International where they fraudulently induced the U.S. Marine Corps to enter into a contract modification at inflated prices. You can type either of these cases in. I got one from the Tennessee Supreme Court and one from the Department of Justice here. Now, this one is not a return. This one is one they have already agreed to pay. So I found both of these interesting because it kind of highlights that as a company, if you make garbage or you artificially inflate the prices like they were here or fraudulently say things cost more than they do or say they're more reliable than they are, you're going to end up paying for that in general. Now, obviously, it's a little different style video than I'm used to making, but it kind of tied in with the engine I was working on before. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.